Are we working with Mike? Okay, great. Um, so thanks, Salil, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking, as you said, about script systems. And so if we're going to start talking about script systems, probably the right place to start is what is script. So script is a term for any sort of currency that is not backed by a government. Um, so you know, there's been a lot of it throughout history and a lot of it in the world. So for example, airline frequent flyer miles are something you can redeem for something of value. Um, but they're not issued by any government, so they're a form of script credit card rewards points. Um, companies would issue their currencies in uh, company towns uh, as a way of controlling the flow of money that their workers were spending. So it's been sort of a long history of people using these artificial currencies for a variety of reasons because it gave them some sort of advantage over using a standard government-backed currency. Um, sort of historically, one of the headaches, however, if you wanted to build your own currency to do something, is then you had a whole physical currency to administer. You had to sort of print up some sort of uh, coupon or something and you know, keep, the keep a supply of those coupons around and arrange for people to process things in those coupons and, and uh, keep records about them. Um, so there's a lot of overhead um, to doing this. Um, and so uh, enter computers. People realize that, hey, you know, we have computers. They're great at doing all the sorts of bookkeeping. We can just have these computer systems do the bookkeeping for us. And as people realize that, they said, you know, we can, use, we can use currencies to solve all sorts of problems, both within computers and using computers to um, do other things. So it's been a huge explosion of work um, in the computer science literature of people who are interested in using artificial currencies to solve various problems. And I've sort of divided it up into two groups. So the top is people who are looking at issues of what economists call free riding. That is, you have a whole bunch of people participating in something. Um, but they'd rather not actually do work or contribute anything to the system they're using. They're much happier just to take stuff from it. Um, and so this comes up, and for example, when people are sharing files on, on the internet. Uh, you know, people like downloading things. They don't like so much uploading things. And so there's been a lot of work, um, some of it from here, on various ways you can use a currency to sort of pay people for the work they do to encourage people to participate in your system. Uh, and then there's a second whole line of work that says, well, one of, one of the things money is great for is making decisions about how to allocate resources, right? We find prices, and that's how we determine who it is should be using various scarce resources. Um, so why don't we do that in computers? So there's been a line of work uh, trying to do things like um, how should we allocate things in a distributed database? So that's Mariposa up there. Um, there's also been people that said, hey, we can use this to help people make decision making. So Utils is a project by some people at Yahoo Research. And their idea is that you can, they can use currency to help people make daily decisions like where to go for lunch by expressing, by sort of expressing their interest in uh, paying each other in this fake currency because you don't want to be actually spending money to you know, determine among your friends where you should be going for lunch. But this sort of gives a way to ensure fairness over time in making these sorts of decisions. So there's been a lot of people who are very interested uh, in building these systems for a variety of purposes. Um, and particularly if you look at some of the earlier work, there's a sense of, if I make a market, my world is great. Um, you, you get phrases, you know, uh, market mechanism can yield orderly systems beyond the ability of any individual to plan. And, you know, you have an invisible hand that's going to make sure our system uh, works well. Um, but, you know, if you've Looking at the news over the past couple of years, it's pretty clear that markets don't always uh, come to ideal outcomes, right? You know, markets can screw up in a variety of ways. You can have bubbles. You can have various things. Uh, people can get in and try to manipulate your markets uh, in various fashions. Um, so, you know, the economy at large is vulnerable to all sorts of things. But here we're thinking about smaller economies, sort of a, of a more narrow purpose with various constraints on them. Um, so we are, you know, are these smaller economies also vulnerable to the same sorts of problems? And what should a person who's designing these systems do to optimize the uh, performance of the system? You, know, you get questions like, how much money should you print? Um, and to show you that, that there are real problems uh, in even these very simple economies, I'm going to talk about uh, an actual script system that was used on uh, Capitol Hill uh, in Washington, D.C. in the late 70s. And what it was was a bunch of parents 
uh, young uh, people who worked for uh, Congress in various capacities as aides and the like. They were young parents, and because they were working for uh, the government, they had various. They might get called away on an evening to work late on some pending bill or for various other reasons, so they might need babysitting for their children on short notice. Um, so what they, they agreed to do is a whole bunch of these parents got together and they agreed to provide babysitting services for each other. Um, and so you know, they, were, they were worried about fairness in various respects, so what they decided to do was they decided to print up coupons, and each coupon, you know, this was the script in their system, would be worth half an hour of babysitting. Um, so everyone got an initial allocation of these coupons, and then they were sort of forced to babysit as much as they had their children babysat for because they needed to have enough coupons to pay people. Um, so for a while, this worked really well. You know, everybody's babysitting needs were taken care of. Um, but over a time, as it turned out, for various reasons about the way the system was set up, money was slowly leaving the system. And they discovered at some point that there was a problem that... Uh, so everyone wanted to have a reserve of currency so that you know, if they had to go out, go out several nights in a row, they could pay for the babysitting. Um, so people were going to say, well, you know, I don't have much money left, so I'm not going to go out, you know, say, on Friday night. I'm going to stay in, and in fact, I'm going to try to babysit for someone else to earn money. Which, if you're the only person doing it, this works really well, right? You, know, you, you don't get to go out, which you don't like very much, but you get some currency that you need that you can then use down the road. Unfortunately, if everyone is staying in Friday night, then not only is no one going out and enjoying their Friday night, but no one can earn any money because if you're not going out, I can't work for you. All right, so the babysitting co-op over time got itself into this strange position where uh, you know, people were, were afraid to spend their money because they didn't think they could earn more money. But because no one was spending money, they couldn't actually earn more money. So, they, so if it was a real economy, we'd say the babysitting co-op entered a recession. Right, so they had, a, they, they, had a, they had a problem where you know, not much was happening except people still had to go out occasionally because they would get called away for work and for the like. So you know, they realized this was a problem, and so they tried to come up with various solutions. So uh, the first solution that people uh, involved in the co-op proposed uh, was that you should, just, you should change the rules and mandate things like you must go out twice a month. Right? <laughs> uh, and, and, and needless to say, this, you know, this, this didn't solve the problem at all. People sort of found ways to get around it or did the bare minimum. Um, and things were still very efficient. So there were some, some of the people involved in this group were economists. And they convinced the rest of the group that the correct thing to do was just to print more money. So this is eventually what they did. They gave everyone sort of, say, 10 hours more of coupons. Uh, and the results were pretty dramatic. Now everyone had a reserve of money. Um, so they were happy to go out. And since people were happy to go out on Friday night, if, you, if some person felt a little low on money, they had an easy time finding someone who needed a babysitter so they could earn money. Um, so the uh, economy started booming. Right? The, uh, the, the number of babies babysat went up uh, dramatically, and things were good. Uh, right, right, so you're, you're anticipating. So eventually, uh, if some money is good, more money must be better. Right? And eventually, they ended up with the opposite problem. Um, so there isn't inflation, per se, in this economy, because prices are fixed. Right? A coupon is always going to be worth half an hour of babysitting. Uh, but you can get a related problem where, if there's a lot of money around and everyone feels rich, well, if I have a lot of coupons, I don't really like babysitting. Right? You know, taking care of other people's young children is not at the top of most people's list of fun activities. So if everyone's field rich, you might have plenty of coupons to pay somebody, but you can't actually find someone who wants to babysit. Right? So, you don't, so you don't get inflation because prices are fixed, but indeed you do get a problem when, uh, when the supply of money is too large. Right? So even in this extremely simple economy, right? there's only one good babysitting. There's only, you know, there's, you and the currency is only good for one thing. There's one service. That's it. You can get real problems if you put the wrong amount of money into the system. Um, so, you know, so this sort of example says that we sort of need to be careful when we're building these things, that if we, if we want them to work well and serve our goals, we need to have some idea of how the economy is going to be behaved. Um, surprisingly, there's been relatively little work looking at these uh, toy economies, even from the economics literature, where you might expect some of it. So there's been a little bit. Um, so the first paper I mentioned up here is, is uh, 
is from the economic literature, it is a model sort of of based on the babysitting co-op story uh, I just told you. Um, although it assumes sort of the major issue in the economy is one of opportunity cost. Uh, so they say, right, you can't both, it doesn't make much sense to both babysit for someone else and have yourself babysat for at the same time. So sort of any, any time you have to be making a decision between one or the other, and that's the fundamental trade-off people are making in the economy. It sort of makes sense, right? You have a choice between going out or, uh, or babysitting, uh, which makes sense in that context, but not so much sense in, um, say, a large computer system where it's perfectly reasonable to have someone doing work for you and be doing work for someone else of a different sort at the same time. Um, and since we started this work, there's been uh, a little bit of other work uh, in the computer science literature by Prajit Johari, who looked at um, an economy in a file sharing system uh, although they didn't actually have an explicit currency. They, they used explicit prices, but uh, everything was done instantaneously. People were paying each other in bandwidth, so uh, they sort of avoided the uh, longer-term issues of currency in that fashion. Um, so the approach I'm going to talk about, um, what we did is, so we developed a microeconomic model of uh, what it is people in a script system are doing. Um, and so then we send, said, OK, so we know sort of what it is, what's the game people are playing. And uh, so we want to determine what it is people should be doing. You know, I'm, I'm an agent in this script system. What, how should I be managing my money? Uh, so we're going to look for a, a best reply. What is the optimal thing for them to be doing, given what other people are doing? Uh, and then we show that the model has a stable outcome, which is so where we expect it to be in technical terms of Nash equilibrium. Question? Um, the, the major difference is that, so if I, if I have a dollar, I can buy all sorts of other things with this dollar. So when I'm asking uh, how much is, say, you know, a bottle of water worth to me, I say, well, there's this whole you know, universe of things. I have sort of a sense of what a dollar is worth from the universe of things I could be buying, which makes it easy to say, how much is this worth to me? Uh, Right, exactly. So that, 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 that's a major reason. Because it, sort of, it sort of restricts the domain of, of trade going on. And so, do you, do you see, so now, right, well, what, what is a coupon worth a half hour of babysitting worth to me um, if I'm you know, planning on doing all my babysitting within the system? Well, it's worth, you know, depends on how much babysitting I'm going to be needing down the road. And that's exactly the sorts of trade-offs uh, we're going to talk about when we get to the model. Mm -hmm. uh, for recurrency in uh, various uh, you know, these markets. Uh, so what happens if the script uh, becomes uh, transferable and exchangeable? Does your analysis break down because it becomes instead universal? Um, so somewhat possibly. So it, it depends sort of what the incentives of the sort of the bulk of the people in the market are doing. So the results are generally robust to sort of some small fraction of the people doing sort of weird things for whatever reason. Um, so I'd say that you know, if, if, if a real world exchange is sort of on the margins, it's probably OK. If, if that comes to sort of dominate the reason that many people are participating in the economy, then indeed you're sort of moving to a regime that this model doesn't describe very well. Uh, right, so, so sort of specify formally what we think is going on in a script system. Uh, so you have an agent, some large number of, of people out there that want to use a system, and they all want to have work done. You can think of this as they, they need babysitting in the babysitting co-op. Um, so, so we're going to think of this as going on in a series of rounds, and in each round we're going to say that 
uh, one person is going to be randomly chosen from among those people to need, to need the service provided. Um, and then each other agent has to decide uh, whether or not to volunteer. Now, in reality, you might think of this as all, you know, lots of people doing this at the same time, but for simplicity, we're breaking this down into all of those things happening one at a time. Um, and so assuming somebody volunteers to satisfy the request, uh, one of those volunteers is going to be chosen to be the person who actually gets to satisfy. Right? There might be a lot of people willing to babysit you, but only you're only actually going to have one of them babysit for you. Um, and then for that current round, the person who uh, made the request uh, gets a payoff of one unit of utility. They're happy that you know, their babysitting need was taken care of. Um, but they have to pay a dollar. We're going to call our unit of script dollar. Uh, and the volunteer uh, has to pay some small cost in utility, say minus alpha, because you know, people typically don't like babysitting. Or if we're talking about a file sharing system, they don't like using up their bandwidth. They could have been doing, doing other things with that. Um, but they earn a dollar that they can then spend in the system down the road. And everyone else has nothing happen for the round. And then so we're going to think of this as going on for an infinite number of rounds. And so we're going to have agents discounting their future utility, which is the standard uh, way in economics that people think about these repeated games. Um, the word delta uh, in this picture is sort of a rate at which I value things in the future less than I value them now. Question? Definitely simplifying something. I'm essentially assuming um, there uh, is, is, is only one good, and every time you want something, it's of equal value. So there's sort of no real decision to make. So you could think of sort of uh, generalizing this model in many directions. One, one of them, uh, some of those directions we've generalized it in. That particular one, we haven't generalized the model enough, although I've actually been doing a little bit. It does look at that direction very recently. Um, and uh, so the issue is then you, you could think of then as uh, you know each time having to make a decision based on the value of that particular request that came in to me, and so I'd be more likely to make requests for uh, if the requ make the request if it was more valuable to me. Um, it turns out that the math, the, the nice mathematical solution we have breaks in that case. So we don't know how to talk about it, although having run some simulations, it looks like things should still be well behaved in that case. I'm actually looking at seeing if we can extend the model, but can't directly say anything about that yet. Um, but um, sort of intuitively looking at it, it looks like uh, it shouldn't be too different. Um, Right, and so you could think you could think of uh, you know as I said that's that's one way you could think of generalizing this. You could think of generalizing this um, in a number of directions. Right, you could have different types of people who place different values on having the request. Uh, maybe people have different likelihoods of being able to satisfy the request. Maybe some people are busy more often than others, and therefore not available to babysit many nights. Um, so you could think of sort of generalizing this game in in a number of ways, and those sorts of things uh, are in some of the papers, one sort of assumption that is essential and you know, we'll be coming back to is that we fix the price of, the, of a request at a dollar, which, which um, explicitly rules out the possibility of inflation, sort of that every, uh, the cost of a request in the future is always going to be what it is now, and this does have some consequences that we'll talk about down the road. Um, on the other hand, there's some advantages to doing this uh, because uh, if you think about doing a system, if you're going to not fix prices, you have to um, have some mechanism by which prices are set. And so that can impose overhead on the people using the system. Right? They have to think about, well, how much should I pay for this particular one? Um, and so if you're, if you're doing something where you have to make that decision hundreds of times a second, you probably don't want to be using, as it might be the case in sort of a system like BitTorrent, probably don't want to be using uh, a price setting mechanism. Um, 
So we've, so we've described the model of the game that the agents are playing with each other. Um, and so I said, so what is, what is it that an agent should be doing intuitively? Well, at some round he has you know, K dollars, say. And someone else has made a request. And he has to decide whether or not he should volunteer to satisfy that request, pay some cost now, and earn a dollar. Um, so why is it that he should or shouldn't be doing that? Well, uh, why, why would he want to satisfy the request? Well, if he's feeling poor at a point in time, right, if he has no money, then he'd really like to have some money so that when he wants to make a request, he has money to pay for it. Right? So if he, if, if he doesn't have money at a point in time or feeling poor, and he probably wants to satisfy, volunteer to satisfy a request. Um, so now why would I not want to satisfy a request? Well, it, it costs me something to satisfy a request now. Right? I have to do some work. Um, and generally, I'd rather wait and do that work later if I could. Uh, so if I'm sitting on a million dollars and you're going to offer me a dollar to do some work for you, that dollar doesn't buy me pretty much. Right? It's going to take me a long time to spend that million dollars that I have. So I'm not going to be particularly interested in working for you. Um, so these two uh, sort of competing trends are sort of naturally balanced by uh, a class of strategies that we call threshold strategies, which is I'm going to set some threshold, and if I have less than that amount of money, I'm feeling poor, and I want to volunteer. And if I have that amount of money or greater, then I'm feeling, you know, I have enough money for now, I'm not going to volunteer. And sort of K being my comfort level, how much I need to have saved up uh, to make future requests. Uh, so I've... I've, I've, I've uh, I'm saying that these are sort of an intuitive class of strategies, um, but they're not the only thing, right? You could say, you know, maybe people are doing some other history-dependent thing, or maybe there's some richer class of strategies. Uh, so what we show uh, in our papers is that, well, first say, suppose people are using these strategies, right? They could be using all sorts of things, but suppose everyone is using these strategies. And actually, we can use some nice techniques uh, from statistical physics, including maximum entropy, to characterize what the distribution of wealth is going to look like in the economy. Uh, and then using this understanding, we can show that given that everyone else is playing a threshold strategy, it's approximately optimal for me to play a threshold strategy as well. That is, a threshold strategy is, a, is an approximate best reply to other threshold strategies. So thus, even if people are allowed to do any sort of crazy thing, there are equilibria where people play these uh, natural threshold strategies. And so then given sort of, so this is going to be, I'm going to spend a little while on sort of the mathematical issues here. Um, and then I'm going to come back up to a high level and start looking at, well, OK, so what do these models and results say about the design and behavior of a real system? So I'm going to look at um, uh, it, f f things like, for example, more money is generally better until the system undergoes what we call a crash. And that's Sort of this graph down at the bottom here, you can see that so that's a plot of the average amount of money on the x-axis and social welfare on the y-axis. And as you can see, social welfare is increasing, it's increasing, it's increasing with the amount of money, and suddenly it goes down to zero. And so this is a, this is a feature we'll come back to and talk more about later. Are there questions to this point? Um, Depends what information you give me, uh, is the answer. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Social welfare is right, is the sum of the utilities of agents in the system. And clearly, since this is in this very simple model, everyone is symmetric. It's sort of the expected utility of a single agent as well. Um, so it's sort of going on to a technical level, sort of our, our understanding of uh, how the economy behaves when everyone is using these threshold strategies comes from looking at the system as a Markov chain, um, where uh, the states of our Markov chain are going to be the amount of money that each agent has. Um, and the transition probabilities are going to be determined uh, based on sort of the, uh, the, the amount of money the agent has and what threshold strategy uh, they're using. Um, and so what's sort of a key fact about the Markov chain, at least in this very simple case, is that the Markov chain has a uniform limit distribution. That means in the limit, each state, where a state tells you how much money each person has, is equally likely. So if you look at the system at an arbitrary, at some long time off in the future, then any allocation of money to people 
is equally likely. Everyone's using some threshold strategy is good enough. Uh, any any feasible distribution of money? Yeah. Um, and and so the reason this comes out is it turns out that if you look at this chain, the transition probabilities are symmetric. Um, so suppose right. Uh, so I put, I put up two states here. Uh, one, you see the only difference between the states, uh, the two states, is that the guy in the gray suit and the guy in the blue suit have different amounts of money in the two. Everyone else has the same. So these are states that can be reached. You can go from the state on the left from the, to the state on the right by having the guy in the gray suit pay the guy in the blue suit a dollar. Right, so what's the probability of that happening? Uh, well, the guy in the gray suit has to be chosen at random to make a request. So there are five people, so that probability is one-fifth. And then we say, who's going to volunteer? So we'll say, suppose everyone's using a threshold of three dollars. Then so th those three people outlined in green are the ones that volunteer. Then we're going to choose one of them at random. So the guy in the blue suit can be chosen with probability one third. So the overall probability that this transition will happen is one fifteenth. Um, now, simply if we're going the, now to go back the other direction, we need the guy in the blue suit to be chosen to pay in the guy in the gray suit a dollar. Well, what's the probability of the guy in the blue suit being chosen? Um, it's still one-fifth, right? There's five people, and you have to pick the right guy at random. And then there's still going to be exactly three volunteers. We have to choose the right one, which is probably one-third. So again, the probability is one fifteenth. So the transition probabilities in each direction are the same, and it's sort of a, a standard fact about Markov chains that this means you have a uniform limit distribution, sort of a one-line proof. Uh, then the transition is to the same state. It's a self-loop. Right, so no, no one's going to volunteer for him because he can't pay anyone. Did you have a question? Uh, if the guy in the gray suit paid, they have zero script, then the guy in the gray suit would have two dollars, and the guy with uh, zero script would have one dollar. So he would then, on the other side, have a dollar to pay to make make the request. So there's two distributions. So I said the distribution over states. So the distribution over allocations of money is going to be uniform, at least in the simple case. The math gets more complicated when you change some of the assumptions that make this symmetric, but you can still do it. Um, what's not going to be uniform uh, is the distribution of overall wealth. That is, what fraction of people have each amount of money. Um, and so the way to think about this is suppose that there are a whole lot of people out there and there are two dollars. Uh, so so we said each, each way of allocating those $2 to an agent is going to be equally likely. However, think about the ways you could give both dollars to the same agent. Right? You have to pick one agent and give him both those dollars. So there's n different ways you could do that. So there's n states. Uh, however, now think about the ways you could give those $2 to different agents. Right? You have to pick one agent. There are n choices. And you have to pick another agent. There's n minus one choices. There's n choose two ways to do this. So there's order n squared ways to give the two dollars to different agents. So although each underlying state is equally likely, uh, the overall distribution of money, and not all distributions of money, what fraction of people have each amount of money, are equally likely. So you know, in the long run, it's massively more likely, with probability tending to one as n gets large, that we're going to see different agents with those two dollars. Sort of this is what's known as a as a concentration phenomenon. It's some distributions of wealth. Because while each state is unlikely, some distributions can just be realized many more ways. Um, so they're combinatorially much more likely. But my choice of strategy doesn't affect the uh, So in a large system, your personal choice is not going to have much of an effect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, that's, uh, that's the up. Entropy is exactly where we're going in. Uh, in a slide or two. Uh, 
not really chose Yes. Right. Yes. So, 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 right. So, 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 this is a, a sort of a shock that's missing in here, as I guess in the babysitting co op, where every so often you're sort of forced to go out and you, know, you pay some big penalty in utility if you didn't have any, uh, any script at that point. So, you could, you could add that sort of thing into the model. Um, right, so you, so you could th you could think of that as, uh, as as me being the chosen agent, but then that allows me to go out because I have too little too little money. So that's uh, um, right, and, and so in that case, you you need to, as part of your strategy to specify how it is you made that decision. That's sort of a natural way to have a second threshold, right? Um, and, and, and I think things sort of generally behave the same way in that world, but the math I'm about to describe breaks down there. It's the same issue that question that I believe Salil raised earlier. Um, uh, right, as, as I was mentioned, right, so, uh, so there's sort of a, a connection between counting the number of ways to realize uh, a distribution and entropy. Um, and so you know, where it comes out of, uh, so if you want to know, uh, you know, I have n people, and I want to know what are the number of ways I can have n i people uh, with i dollars, right? So I want n zero people with zero dollars, and one people with one dollar, et cetera. That's the big n. Choose all of those different things. Um, so you get a whole bunch of factorials there, and you can use Sterling's approximation to write it out in a form that looks like this. And note that that term on the right looks an awful lot like entropy, it's right, this, this the standard form of the, of the entropy of distribution. So we can just write this as sort of the weight, the number of ways to realize that distribution is, is sort of proportional to uh, e to the entropy of that distribution times big N. Uh, and so, right, so this is, so what this says is that sort of if one distribution has uh, sufficiently uh, a higher entropy than another, then if you make n large enough, you're almost certainly, uh, you know, become, you become essentially more likely to see that uh, distribution with higher entropy than the other. So we'd expect that with large enough n, essentially all the time we're going to be seeing distributions that look like the distribution that maximizes entropy. Um, right. So we can so we can say, okay, so we don't want to find what is the distribution that maximizes entropy. Um, so I'm Changing slightly and saying, and instead of ni being a number, I'm just going to have ni be the fraction to keep the slide a little simple. Um, we have some average amount of money m, and ni fraction of agents have i dollars. We want to find out what's the distribution of money that we're going to get. So we want to maximize the entropy subject to the constraint that uh, the average amount of money is m, and uh, you know the whole distribution n has to be a probability distribution. Um, and so actually, so this this equation I've told you a story right that for these constraints involving an average amount of money. Uh, so if you just interpret this as, uh, instead of m being money, m being energy, uh, and uh, instead of being different amounts of money, you could be thinking of being at different energy levels. This is an equation right out of statistical physics. And indeed, so this equation, you know, it's, it's well known how to solve this using Lagrange multipliers. Um, so it's sort of uh, a nice sort of but once we get to this point, we can take off the shelf. Um, so we know how to solve it. We know, in fact, you know, we can give an explicit formula for uh, what things look like. So here I've made things a little fancier. And this is addressing one of the questions. Here I'm allowing people to play multiple different threshold strategies. So now N NIK is a fraction of people who have I dollars and have chosen threshold K. Um, and, right, and so this, then pi K is going to be the fraction of people who have chosen threshold k, and there's this, this lambda term in here, which is essentially set to ensure that the constraint on the amount of money 
is satisfied. And so you can use that to make a plot like this is what the, this is a plot of the amount of money versus the fraction of agents. So it's a plot of what the distribution of wealth looks like um, in a population where uh, some fraction of the agents have, uh, have a threshold of 13 and the rest of them have a threshold of 20. Um, so, you know, we have the, 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 a very nice thing about this formulation is that we can give sort of, uh, we can explicitly compute what the distribution of wealth uh, looks like, which is going to let us, um, it's going to be, let me make a whole lot of nice figures later uh, illustrating how various changes affect the economy. Um, and also, that it might be hard to sort of see what, uh, you know, the, get, get a sense of in general how this formula works. Um, one, one thing to note is that, uh, is that you have this lambda to the i term there. So if you, if you take the log of the term, or just plot it on a log plot, um, that says that when you take the log, you get i log that, the i comes down. So what it's saying is that essentially you get these straight lines when you look at the economy on a log plot to give you sort of a sense of what the shape of the world is. And that jog there is caused by Right, one of the types having a threshold at that point. Um, this sort of makes a, a, a prediction about what the state of an economy should look like. And also, um, now, uh, it answers a little bit to, Tyler, to Tyler's question is, uh, so if you tell me everything about everyone, I can compute what the optimal average amount of money should be. Uh, but I might not know everything about everyone, or I, you know, I, I don't not know everyone's value for having a service and the like, which means I might not be able to tell you exactly. But I can sort of look at the distribution of wealth and get a sense of what people are doing from that, and maybe try to infer some information about them from looking at a realized distribution of wealth. Um, you know, just by the sort of saying, "Hey, that's probably a point where somebody, some fraction of people, are using a threshold," and I can back that out from the exact value. Uh, so are there questions through that point? Okay, so now we have sense. So given given a whole bunch of people using threshold strategies, we said we can you know give this nice mathematical description of how the distribution of wealth in the economy ends up. So now you know now we have to go back and ask, answer the question: Well, why why the heck are these the right strategies? You know, I gave some intuition, but why is it that these strategies are optimal for people? Um, uh, so uh, so what we show is that uh, if fix everyone else as a threshold strat uh, as playing a threshold strategy, then I, as a single agent in the system, have an approximate best reply, formerly an epsilon best reply, that is also a threshold strategy. Uh, so this comes from you can think of once I fix the behavior of everyone else, um, from my perspective, the system becomes a Markov decision pro problem. Uh, so now. I'm just essentially, my amount of money is wandering up and down over time as I make decisions about whether to volunteer or not. And I can abstract the actions of everyone else since they're fixed out into sort of the randomness of nature. So I have a Markov decision problem. And it satisfies nice properties that mar of, of a Markov decision problem to have an optimal threshold policy. Um, and it's approximate because the thing we did about maximum entropy before said, uh, after a sufficiently long time, right, because we're using a limit distribution, and almost always will be close to the maximum entropy, so those things are why you have an epsilon wrapping them up there. Um, and furthermore, uh, the best reply function has a really nice property that it's monotone in the strategy of other agents. That is, if a whole bunch of other people go out and raise their threshold, I only want to raise my threshold as well. I don't want to lower it. Um, and so games with monotone best reply functions are a, a very nice class of the games, yes? Right, so, uh, so you could think, so you, you could think of this as a delta is the discount rate. Uh, so right, so, so essentially you need people to be sufficiently patient that they're willing to wait for the long run behavior. If you have really impatient people that only care about what happens right now, then sort of the optimal thing to do is spend all your money and go away. Right. 
and basically for any strategy in the uh, trade, there's going to be, uh, any strategy there's going to be an excellent response given enough people, but the number of people in a certain future, the chance of meeting children are just a bit better, smaller and smaller, and therefore my strategy doesn't really matter because I can just do right. so, so, so you So you have to, uh, you have to, 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 to have this all make sense, you, you have to scale delta, the discount rate, with the number of people, or equivalently scale the time between rounds with the number of people. Um, so you're right, so there is sort of, that's sort of a technical detail I swept under the rug. Right, because they, that, that saying, you know, I, I'm making requests less and less often, but really I want to normalize everything, so no matter how many people there are, from my perspective, I'm making a request once per time unit, where time unit is sort of scaled, and we think of these things as going on in parallel. Um, so I, I want to be making a babysitting, I want to want babysitting once a week, no matter how many people there are in the world. So you do need to do some normalization to make that happen. Um, Spencer said, so this is a game with monotone best replies, which puts us in a nice world in game theory. Um, so it, it sort of follows immediately that uh, there exist greatest and least Nash equilibrium. This is sort of a concept of, uh, of Tarski's fixed point theorem. Uh, we have a monotone function on a lattice, has greatest and least fixed points. Um, sort of Topkis brought the, this idea into game theory. Uh, so that's nice consequences, right? So we sort of knew that there was uh, uh, a least equilibrium to begin with, right? So if you a least equilibrium is everyone playing a threshold of zero, which is pretty clear as an equilibrium. So if no one is ever willing to volunteer, then, well, I'm not going to be willing to volunteer either, right? My money is essentially worthless if no one else will ever volunteer. So no one doing anything is always going to be an equilibrium. But the more interesting thing is, is that, you know, this shows that uh, people situation, there are equilibria where people actually do things. Um, uh, and furthermore, we can actually find this equilibrium uh, by iterating best replies. That gives us a simple, uh, I won't talk about it in any detail, but it gives us a simple algorithm to find the find equilibrium in practice just by iterating best reply dynamics it's, that you know, works well enough that I could generate all the graphs that I'm going to use in the rest of the talk uh, very quickly. Um, Right, so now let's, now let's, so we've, uh, sort of, that sort of ends the sort of deep, uh, uh, you know, analysis of the model for now. Um, so now we're going to just jump up a level uh, and talk about how do I want to go about uh, using this model to answer questions about script systems. Right, what is this, you know, this model and what does this say about how I should be designing them? Um, so this is this is the same graph I had before that talked that showed how is social as the amount of money is increasing, social welfare is also increasing, until we hit some sharp point, and we hit a big crash. Um, and so uh, you can think about what's happening here as or this was the problem in uh, the in the uh, basic job where everyone starts to feel rich. And as the amount of money is going up and up and up, the number of people with zero dollars is getting smaller, which is good. Right? The people with zero dollars are the people who can't actually make requests when they want to because they can't pay for them. So, so social welfare is increasing as you're increasing the amount of money. But you also need the possibility that people have zero dollars to have them be worried about the amount of money they have. Right? If I'm not worried about having zero dollars anytime soon, then uh, that I'm, you know, I'm happy with my amount of money and I'm not going to be doing any work. So you need there to be sort of an equilibrium some noticeable group of people with zero dollars to ensure that people are sort of hungry for work and want to be earning money. So you hit some critical threshold after which uh, things drop and no one, there's no longer a equilibrium where people do work. Um, and so you could think of, so if you, if you, if you go back um, to this previous graph, you're going to think about technically what's happening is that as you increase the amount of money, this best reply function is going down and being forced below. So eventually, the best reply function becomes tangent to the line, and at that point, social welfare is great. But once that function gets pushed below the line, 
there's no longer any stable point for any, any, any set of threshold strategies other people are using. I want to use a lower threshold. So we just race down to no one doing anything. Um, right, so this is sort of. Mm -hmm. So, right, so if, if uh, so, so, so if people ha ha have very low thresholds, then right, that Markov chain essentially becomes disconnected because I start in a state and I never go anywhere from there, right? No, one, no one's ever willing to work, so I just, it, it does become disconnected in, in, in the very low end. Um, so what happens is, uh, at this point, there are still uh, thresholds at which things would happen, that that chain would still be connected and things would work. No, but, globally. But, but globally, it's not optimal for people to be playing those strategies. I mean, sort of there's a global graph of the X separated from all the global graphs. Is that what you're implying? Is that, is that um, at, it, it, it's more a matter of what strategies people are willing to play. So you could come up with strategies at that point where it would be split into multiple components and strategies where it would uh, uh, be sort of one unified component and things would still work. And indeed the problem is that at th this point is at the point where the only strategies people are willing to play any longer are the ones where it splits up into those multiple components. So yeah. Um, question? Uh, so the, the slope of the crash, so the crash is, uh, so this is just uh, the computer's connected line for me, but it's actually just the sharp down to zero. Uh, so it's not actually a slope. Um, and, and, and that sharpness is because, so if you keep adding money little by little, um, eventually you're left with the best response being right, uh, exactly one best response point, o only one point where I'm willing to work at least that hard. And eventually you push that one point below the line, whatever that critical epsilon is to move it below that line, you've immediately jumped from optimal to nothing. So what this says is there's sort of an efficient, a sort of a scary efficiency robustness trade-off in these systems with fixed prices, where if you push it a little, to, things are looking great, things are looking great, you push in a little more money, and boom, you fall off a cliff. Uh, so you probably there's sort of a trade-off here where you want to be, you don't want to be trying to make it as efficient as possible because otherwise, you know, if you misestimated your your population change a little bit, you're falling off the cliff. So there's definitely an efficiency robustness trade-off. Question. Are you willing to pay double uh, the going rate for the fact that it would be you know, like two hours needed to get from this point to this point? Or that you didn't trust another programmer and therefore you didn't want to share code with him? Or you didn't want to work on this project because you knew that this was not right. Oh, so Right, so this, is, so this is actually getting back to the subject I made earlier, so that we, that we fixed the price of everything at a dollar and aren't allowing people to pay a different amount. And, and indeed, so this sharp crash is a necessary sort of consequence of fixing everything in a dollar and not allowing people to diverge. You could say, well, what if I do it? So the, pro the, so the problem here, things crash because we hit the point where no one is willing to work for a dollar. And that doesn't say that it doesn't make sense to people wait, work for two dollars or three dollars. So you could think of this crash, if we were allowing prices to float freely, this crash being a point where we want, expect to see a burst of inflation as sort of the system in, in, inflates its way back to essentially effectively a lower average amount of money uh, in real terms. Right, and so this talks about, right, so now I have a system that's growing. You know, what, sh what should my, what should policies should I be adopting, say, with new users and things like that? to uh, adjust the system that grows. And so what, so what these results say is that uh, the thing to be doing is to find an average amount of money that works well and then you want to keep yourself pegged at that average amount of money. Um, so you either you want to be printing and removing money over time as churn is altering your amount of money, uh, or you want to be, uh, you can equivalently alter the price, the fixed price over time. Right? If you suddenly just jump the price a little bit, that's equivalent to adjusting the amount of money uh, in circulation. Uh, so you could do that sort of big inflationary jump yourself if you hit a point that it needed. This also says so that you know 
if you notice you're falling off that cliff, right, the amount of willingness to work with people is driving down to zero, you can sort of react to it and then just readjust the price structure of your system. So it doesn't have to be sort of, you know, catastrophic. Your system is done if you go off that cliff. You can sort of recover from having gone off that cliff. Um, right, and so now we say, well, you know, so far we've assumed that everyone is rational, everyone has the same utility function, everyone behaves, right? Well, how does, how does the world work if people start doing strange things in your system? Um, so one thing uh, you might want to be able to do is, well, there might be altruists in the world, right? There, you know, maybe there's some guy that really likes babysitting. Uh, or, you know, somebody who's just willing, you know, the default settings of my clients say I'm supposed to help everyone who comes along, so I'm going to help everyone who comes along. Uh, you know, how is that going to affect the behavior of the system? Um, so this is the plot of, on the x-axis, the fraction of requests that are satisfied by altruists, and on the uh, y-axis, uh, social welfare. Um, so you can see that as the fraction of requests being satisfied by altruists goes up and up and up and up and up, things are getting better, right? We have a bit sort of monotonic going up, and then suddenly we get a big drop, and then a straight monotonic increase after that point. Um, so that big drop is a point where everyone who is not an altruist stops doing anything. And so that, so that straight line going up is just, you know, the altruists are satisfying some fraction of the request from then on, and that's what's providing the social welfare. Um, sort of the interesting thing is this is sort of starkly represented for what was happening before, right? Things were getting better, things were getting better, and then suddenly everyone who's not an altruist stops doing anything, right? So effectively we're having a crash. And so... Uh, so if we look at this, so now the upper blue line there is, is that same graph from before. Uh, and below, the other blue line is, is straight. It's because I, we had kept the average amount of money fixed at $4 per agent. Um, so in order that instead is said, okay, well, we're going to adjust the average amount of money to be the optimal amount of money. So you can think of when there are altruists out there, I need money less often. Right, because altruists are going to do some of the work for me for free. So, you know, but if there were no altruists, I might be willing to work when I had $10. But with altruists, well, I'm not going to need that money nearly so soon, so I'm no longer willing to work when I have $10. So what we want to do is we want to back down the average amount of money. Um, and so this is, you can see what's going there, the average amount of money, which is the lower red curve, is going down. And social welfare then, so we can sort of take advantage of the altruist and things still behave well if we adjust the average amount of money for the presence of altruists appropriately. Question? I'm assuming that altruists satisfy the request for some reason. Whatever, whatever that reason is, they're just willing to satisfy it. Right, so yeah, this is, this is, this is the social, right, so that, that is a good point. This is the social welfare of the standard agents. I'm, essentially, I assume some force is exogenously satisfying some fraction of the normal people's requests. Um, and I'm not even actually modifying the altruist as agents in the system. So you could think of maybe you're doing something like, um, you know, you have, you have uh, uh, it turns out that in many systems adding a little bit of altruism makes things work really well. Like what, one, one of the bit reasons BitTorrent works well is it relies heavily on having you know, a little bit of altruism from the seeders and from people randomly exploring for new people. This is what prevents people from getting stuck in various ways. So often, a little bit of altruism can help the system perform in various ways. So this says, you know, you can, you can add a little bit of altruism to your system if it's going to um, make things work better. You just need to uh, appropriately reduce the average amount of money for whatever change you decide to make in sort of the altruistic nature of interactions in your system. Um, so, you know, another thing, right, that, that might be, uh, you know, that's sort of, just guys behaving weirdly in some fashion. Um, but another thing uh, that might happen is you might have some guys who decide to try and manipulate your system, right? So I might uh, go out and create a whole bunch of identities for myself. And sometimes we call these sibyls. Right? So I can make a whole bunch of copies of myself and say I'm out in the system uh, a whole bunch of the time. Uh, and so, right, so I, can, I can be out there and think, well, okay, uh, what can I do with a whole bunch of copies of myself? Right? You can think of, well, I'm not really going to want things more often just because I created a bunch of fake identities. Um, 
And it doesn't, uh, if, if I volunteer to do work, right, I still have to do the same amount of work, no matter which of my identities got chosen to do it. But maybe where having lots of identities could help me is I can sort of bias the process of selecting a random person to satisfy the request in my favor. I can make myself you know, more likely than other people to be chosen to satisfy a request. Sort of, um, well, how does that help me? Um, I'm going to skip over the, uh, the, the, the technical details of it. Um, but sort of at a high level, ha being, ha uh, being picked more often instead of a request means so that I can save up less money. Right? It's easier for me to earn money so I can set a lower threshold. Um, of course, um, this means everyone else has to, has a harder time earning money. Right? So A, they have to set a higher threshold, but B, because they have a harder time earning money, they're going to be spending more time with zero dollars. And spending more time with zero dollars is, uh, is, is sort of the bad thing. Right? It's, what, it's what hurts welfare in the system. So here, what the plot is, so on the uh, uh, x-axis is the fraction of agents with util with Sybil that are creating Sybils. Uh, and on the y-axis, uh, we have uh, social welfare. And then so we have three curves here. So the, the green curve is the social welfare of the agents who aren't creating symbols. And you can see that they're, they uh, start um, going, uh, they usually starts going down, and at some point they're really being hurt by the presence of the other agents having symbols. Um, and then uh, the, red, the red line is the utility of the agents who are creating symbols. Initially, you see they get this big jump above the agents without symbols. And in fact, they're always above the agents without symbols, but by the time everyone has symbols, that's sort of in the end equivalent to no one having symbols, so they're back down to where things were. But note that if almost everyone had symbols and you were the one guy who wasn't creating them, things would be really pretty bad for you. Um, and so then the blue line in the middle is just a weighted average showing how social welfare as a whole um, behaves. Uh, I, I forget what this graph is from. I think they, they, they all, all the ones with symbols created four symbols or something like that. Um, and so what this says is, right, so symbols, so I sort of take away from this graph is that symbols are A, bad, and B, a self reinforcing phenomenon, right? The more symbols that other people, the more other people are out there, are creating symbols and biasing things in their favor, the more of an incentive I have to be doing the same thing. On, you know, on the other hand, uh, early on, you know, the, the gap between people without symbols and with symbols is small. So maybe if they're sort of, in reality, I can sort of make it moderately annoying to create symbols by sort of making you do work to create multiple identities or sort of make you spend resources to keep all these multiple identities alive in some fashion. I can sort of dissuade people from creating these identities if I do it at the start when uh, the advantages of having a symbol are not so great. Um, and so this is this is so sure that there's uh, um, that creating symbols has diminishing returns for me. So you know there there's, there might be initially some point if I'm way down at that front of the graph where if I'm been I'm really less likely than other people I'm having a hard time getting picked to earn money then a symbol or two might be pretty valuable for me. But after some point then adding all these other symbols um, isn't add much. So. If, if I can stomp out that, that sort of desire to put those initial few symbols in, you can sort of get the problem under control early on. Um, uh, uh, you can, you go, now, so that's, that's the general story. You can also construct weird examples where symbols actually make life better. Um, uh, and uh, you might say, well, you know, maybe I can, har may maybe I should be harnessing symbols, right? Maybe if they can occasionally make life better. Um, but if you actually look deeper in the sort of examples you construct, what's actually happen happening is that symbols uh, are look like they're making life better, but actually they're just changing the trade-off you initially made between stability and welfare. And so they're sort of just shifting the curve. So they're they're effectively when they are making life better, effectively what they're doing is increasing the money supply for other agents, and then just pushing you closer to that point of instability where you didn't want to be. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Um, right, so, 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 right, so, 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 so um, another way to interpret some of, these, some of these things is saying there are cases where it might make sense for you to bias the selection algorithm you use intentionally to improve social worth, right? So you can const construct some examples where indeed there might be some population that for whatever reason has a very hard time uh, finding work. And maybe there are some people that can only satisfy a very small number of requests. You know, they can only have, they have a limited capability, so you want to bias things towards your algorithm picking them when they are capable of doing it. And it might be something like biasing towards new users to help them get started or things like that. So I think you can, so this story does say that there are situations where it makes sense to bias your selection procedure. Um, right, and so then like, collusion, and another thing I think if people might, you know, get together and collude. So typically you hear collusion, right, we're saying collusion's a bad thing for things. And so here actually collusion is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing not just for the colluders, but uh, typically also for the people who aren't colluding as well. Um, and sort of at, at a high level, the way you can think of it is the whole point of this script system is to set up collusion. Right, so what you want is you want everyone doing work for each other. Right, so you everyone, want everyone to get together. So if you could tell everyone, okay, get together, set up things so you know, everyone is doing, uh, doing all the work for each other, and then life is great. Right, so the, the uh, issue is you can't actually get that sustained on a large scale. Right, people start free riding and you worry about it, and that's why we wanted to introduce a currency in the first place. What, what, what do colluders actually do, right? So, 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 so if the two of us want to get together and cooperate in some fashion, you know, what, what can we do? Um, well, one thing we can do is we can satisfy each other's requests, essentially, you know, regardless of the amount of money we have. Uh, the other thing we can do is we could potentially loan each other money, right? So we could sort of insure each other. Um, and, right, so you'd say, uh, you know, so as a result, you know, we could, uh, Potentially, uh, you know, not work as hard. We can we, we can benefit for each other. And so what this guy says is that, you know, essentially to, to the extent that people can set up, you know, their own subgroups within where they're helping each other out, that's a good thing for the system. It's not something, you know, co collusion in this case is actually, you know, people cooperating with each other and helping each other out. And that's a good thing to the extent that it can happen without the support of, you know, a system needed to enforce fairness in the process. Right, right. In the limit, right. If, if if everyone manages to collude perfectly, then you don't need a currency at all. They just collude, and everything gets done, and everyone is happy. Right. It could be you know, it could be your friends. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's I guess the good type of collusion. Mm -hmm. well, we don't, we don't say anything how uh, the costs are borne inside the group. We just say that the group as a whole bears the cost and the group as a whole benefits and the whole thing is optimal from the perspective. So inside, right, we don't know how they're dividing up those costs and benefits. Right, they're exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so also this says, right, since collusion is essentially in some ways insuring each other money and creating the ability of loan, creating the ability to have loans in the system is probably a good thing if you can figure out how to solve the problem of me taking a loan and then running off and coming back with a new identity. Uh, so, right, so that's sort of, sort of the barrier to sort of creating this in the system on a broader scale. Um, right, so you could, you could, I guess, um, so, so this sort of relies on the fact that, uh, even the colluding groups still need to participate in the broader economy as a whole. They can't satisfy everything internally. Um, 
right? If you get a collusive group that essentially disappears from the economy, or you know, particularly if everyone but you disappears from the economy in a colluding group, then it could be bad for you. But as long as the collusion doesn't manage to sort of take over your whole economy, then. Uh, they could, they could, but it turns out it's um, not not in their interest to us. Es essentially, um, you, you what, the way the way we model them formally in our arguments about them is you could say, represent all of the colluders as a single person who makes requests more often, and is also more likely to be chosen to satisfy requests because he's a bunch of people. Um, and so you could think of this as if everyone's the same, you can think of this as as a collusive group, just a guy moving seven times as fast. Um, but so, so as he gets larger and larger, some of those opportunities will get satisfied internally. So he won't need to move as often in the broader system, but he will still need to be doing some motion. So you'll be okay. Yeah. So I. So this is actually. Yeah. So uh, you know other 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 results that are in our papers. Right? So one thing I. So, uh, you know what happens when people start hoarding money. Um, Right, so that, that hurts social welfare. Essentially, there's less money available to other people, but you know it's not sort of an infinite process. Keep increasing the amount of uh, money available decreases the effect that those hoarders have on social welfare. So we talk more about the issue I alluded to uh, earlier, talking with Tyler about how uh, we know what the types of people are, what their preferences are, what they're actually doing in the system to try to figure out how to set this uh, set the type of amount of money in practice. Um, uh, more on sort of how the system evolves under best reply dynamics, if you think about it, rather than just the static, this is the equilibrium, how things get there. Uh, and you know, multiple equilibria may exist, but sort of the greatest equilibrium has nicest properties. Um, so sort of to recap everything, sort of at a technical level, uh, maximum entropy and the monotonicity of the best reply function uh, are sort of the keys to analyzing the behavior of the game, um, sort of the key to uh, Managing social welfare is to manage the average amount of money. It's sort of the key knob you have to turn as a designer. And there's sort of a trade off between efficiency and robustness in the system. So thank you. Of best reply dynamics, I can't I can't give any theorems about like the number of best replies needed or anything like that. But in practice, it's it's very rapid in terms of like a of a you know four or five best replies to get there, um, even if you start quite far off. Um, essentially, the reason that happens is that if you think about it, so you know. And the difference between me setting a threshold of, you know, a hundred and a threshold of a million might not be very huge because although I wouldn't principle to be willing to work then if I had, you know, nine hundred thousand dollars, the odds of me actually accumulating so much of the money in the system that I have nine hundred thousand dollars are extremely rare. So those really high strategies don't play much role. So you sort of very quickly get down into this sort of smaller set of strategies and from there converge to the equilibrium. You know, and you know, at worst the size of that set, but in practice pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
it's a strict function, but it seems to be very dependent on all three of so it's a, it's a, there's, you know, there, there are these sort of complementary currencies, but it's the general term. So I, 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 complementary currencies, I guess the, the general term for these things. Um, no, it, it, it is a form of script, definitely. Um, yeah, that's what I, I, did, I did my PhD at Cornell, and Ithaca has a similar thing that they call Ithaca hours, where they were there, they had a, uh, a goal of not, not just uh, encouraging the local spending of money, but also uh, encouraging people to be paid in hours sort of in terms of being representing an hour of work uh, so they so they second so so indeed there's some uh, so I would say the altruism in using them is actually in terms of uh, foregoing the people being willing to forego the opportunities to spend them on other things uh, as users right if, if I'm willing to buy these things, I'm sort of saying I'm allocating this money to my local community, not uh, perhaps you know on better prices or things I could get outside. So I guess that's where the altruism is coming in for me as a user. For the merchants, for the most part, I'm not sure if it's al actually altruistic because uh, in the, they're uh, they, they are accepting things at essentially a discount of face value. They're essentially sort of giving residents willing to participate in this system. Uh, you know, a ten percent price break on things. Maybe they may or may not, right? Um, but 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 it's you know, I, I'd say that's not necessarily altruistic because businesses give discounts to people sort of for all sorts of reasons all the time to try to bring in more things. Um, so I, so I think this model does not have um, a huge amount to say. About that, because you know, there the fundamental trade-off is you know whether I'm willing to restrict myself into this world. But I think what one sort of cautionary thing it does does say is, um, you do want to be careful about sort of you know think about what are the factors that determine the number of coupons um, that you should be printing up, right? So you sort of you need you need you need enough that people can actually use these for their various things. But the crash phenomenon probably isn't as strict because well, if I run out of you know Ithaca hours, I can always just spend dollars. Mm-hmm. 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 Essentially, um, it's, 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 it's sort of a natural outgrowth of, of the standard barter economy you sort of see in, in any community, and for the same reason that you know, as a larger economy, we move from barter to cash. Right? There's sort of economists talk about um, the double coincidence of wants. If you and I are going to barter, dub, double coincidence of wants. Wants. So w and if, if we're going to barter, you have to have something that I want, and I have to have something that you want. Right, or, or we have to be able to set up a cycle where we all, we have to find this cycle where we all want things from each other, where by creating these coupons we can effectively barter knowing that, you know, you might not have anything I want right now, but there's someone else who does. And so indeed that sort of addition of liquidity um, is sort of why there's sort of a natural outgrowth of the informal barter. Right, it's, it's, and so this sort of, and so this the, the sorts of trade-offs you face there are exactly the sorts of trade-offs you face here. Where I was saying in this system, we looked at at fixing um, those things at a, at a single value because if if you're going to set them at different values for different things, you have a big overhead either of some guy who everyone is always going to be mad at about what the relative values of everyone's work are because everyone's work is always my work is always the most valuable, um, or uh, right, you have these freely floating prices, but this sort of puts cognitive problems on people. Right? Every time I have, to I have to sit down and think about 
well, what is this dollar of this currency? What is this hour worth? How much should I be offering for this? So you sort of put a load on people that, you know, the, the, the correct, it's a trade-off, and the correct trade-off probably depends on, you know, maybe people are doing few enough of these that it's okay for them to think about it, or maybe it would help and make people's life easier if you were sort of establishing a sort of a fixed regime. So I'll, ta I'll, I'll take it. Uh, we can talk more offline. I think we're trapping other people. 